Hey everybody, my name's Johan Philip. And I'm Matt Carvel. And we are live! Every Tuesday afternoon for live lunch. That is the place that we take the Sunday teaching and we have a discussion about it. We unpack the different themes, ask some different questions, and we're inviting you to get involved in it. Have a listen or submit some questions. That's all. And we have food. We so do. if you want to find out about some good eating options around Brighton and Hove, tune into live lunch. Well, we get fed physically, <laughs> but you get fed spiritually. Uh, Tuesdays at 1 p.m. live on Instagram, then the video does sit on YouTube and podcast. If you'd like more information about how you can join in with the conversation at Live Lunch, we are emmanuel.com forward slash live lunch. Welcome, everybody, to a not so live episode of Live Lunch. Unfortunately, the internet is down in our studio, so we aren't live. No. But we are recording this conversation. As if it was live. You know what? I think probably, I'm going to stick my neck out here and say that probably a lot of people who watch this probably think we're pretending that it's live normally. When in fact it is. We do actually do this live, live every week. But maybe that's just the cynic in me that just that's thinks it. when things are live, it's like, is it really live? Because but this go, is not really live. We as do in, go live on Instagram. Yeah, I know. It's quite hard to think going live on Instagram no I know so. but if most people watch it on YouTube which I oh, think right. they do they'll think oh was this really live they've probably edited it and actually we don't we, because we don't sound edited at all well <laughs> that's, maybe, maybe that's the giveaway all of this waffle would be cut out if we weren't uh, live and Christine would have a much more succinct show yeah. and all that you know uh, no I won't say that carry on all the dodgy things that you say which we wish you hadn't uh, yeah well that's uh, a, this is this is an unfiltered show yeah Anything, yeah. could, anything, could be anything can happen and we're even though we're not alive now yeah. we are not going to edit this nope. so if I say anything or you say or Christine says anything yeah. controversial it's probably going to be Christine isn't it? or oh, really? I'm going to be controversial I was going to say controversial or ungodly and that's probably more likely <laughs> like me and you to say some of that yeah um, we're not going to edit it out it is what it is we you know want to be clear about that even though we're not live anyway let's restart yep <laughs> Um, you were supposed to ask me where I was this weekend. Oh uh, yeah, well, we've not even mentioned Christine is here. Like we should actually <laughs> welcome just, just Christine. Talk, just talk. We'll talk amongst ourselves. Talk amongst yourselves. Christine is here. Thank you. Johan, where were you this weekend? <laughs> I was at Clear Vision. There is a conference we run with our family of churches. Uh, so churches based in Berlin, uh, Krakow, London, and uh, Belfast. Also churches in Amsterdam and Ottawa. Uh, and we gathered together with the students and 20s from those churches for a wonderful time. Why were you there then? For a wonderful <laughs> time. <laughs> for a wonderful uh, time of just community, worship, and, and teaching from the Bible. And the talks online are resources one slash talks. I'm sure if Rachel, our producer today, remembers to drop this into the, bar, into the description. Um, they're just some superb talks. I've heard amazing things about these talks. Yeah. I'm looking forward to listening to them. Yeah, Joel, uh, he, so we had, so we had Joel Virgo and he spoke to us on um, marriage and family, but it really, the people in conversation about it said this felt like a real prophetic uh, word for us now for the, for the um, next few years, really, and a call back to the biblical view of family and marriage but just the way he delivered it um was phenomenal so if you had a chance listen to that one andrew bunt spoke on identity and intimacy and how he navigates how he navigates same-sex attraction and being a christian uh, it's just again full of wisdom there's a q a uh, he did two sessions there was q a at the end of both questions and some really powerful questions were asked including what he thought about the church of england agreeing to bless a gay marriage um, That's the exact opposite of what Church of England. Oh no, they no. You're right. You're right. Actually, you're that right. Is what they have agreed. Slightly more nuanced than that. Well, they've, they've said that people who are, have a marriage can get a blessing in yeah. the church. I, I don't think they've used the language of we're. Yeah, they not they marry. They wouldn't marry. They wouldn't marry yeah. people in their churches, okay. but they would bless. Perform a blessing. I'm sure Andrew Bunn is much more clear than we are yep. about it. So probably he best it point really to well. His that's great I was going to think we should like answer those kind of questions why don't well, we ask those questions well, it sounds like they've already been answered great that's true uh, and then we had Dave Schnitter who spoke um, from the book of Esther about our influence and calling and it was just brilliant so Amazing. highly recommended talks um, that's where I was this weekend Matt you were in the pulpit preaching from Matthew correct sorry Christine you were in Lewis book shopping and well, I'm sure that was wonderful 
it was it was <laughs> sorry man it's alright should we get into yeah the Please. passage this week Matthew 17 um, it was it's a it's a curious um, message a number of people have commented to me since uh, I, I brought the message on Sunday saying oh there's lots in that passage that I wasn't thinking about and to be honest I have to be perfectly honest and I was perfectly honest in my response to them to say you know what I hadn't thought about these things much either and um, I actually yeah really enjoyed digging into it and we'll get I'm sure into what's there what's not there what might be there in the inferences but it's a passage about uh, G- uh, Peter is asked by one of the um a religious leaders tax collector to uh, whether ask the question whether jesus pays uh, is he going to pay the, the the temple tax and then jesus anticipates the conversation with peter and then gives him a curious instruction to find the coin in order to pay the tax from the mouth of a fish and um so i suppose in the message I was focusing on the fact that in Jesus' response, he talks about how, well, he uses the phrase, sons are free, and he uses a very sort of, I guess, mundane question to talk about, well, essentially who he is as the son of God. So he's sort of, you know, revealing to Peter if Peter, well, Peter is kind of already aware, is growing in his understanding of who Jesus is. Um, But so Jesus is saying, essentially, I don't, need to pay this tax because i'm the son of god um but then he says but you know so to not offend them yeah get the coin and get the coin and pay it so it's a message about i spoke about how we re- respond to perhaps to authorities who are unjust towards us and i sort of contrasted jesus response here which i think uh, is symptomatic of not symptomatic similar to other responses that jesus gives Mm. where when he's questioned or when he is uh different situations come up jesus would tell a story jesus would give some teaching uh that pointed towards things of the kingdom and how they are different to things of now Mm. but a lot of that was maybe slightly hidden mystery Mm. story Mm. not quite the the what he's saying is not quite clear later on when jesus gets to jerusalem his opposition and he speaks much more clearly starts talking about the end times and Mm. talks about the the, and then he turns over the tables anyway i can see your eyes are glazing over here so i was literally just thinking like do my eyes look glazed over right now (laughs) (laughs) so the point is i was kind of made from a christian the christian has to navigate the world in front of them increasingly in this society that we live in there's a society that's more and more hostile Mm -hmm. to the message of christianity what are the contexts that we just don't cause offense if we don't need to Mm. and i drew from peter about responding to authority living um uh, under the emperor but fearing god but living under that and but then also there's also jesus shows turning over the tables there might be a time for that as well so though that was kind of the the two really helpful I, i'm really enjoying it. these <laughs> these fresh revelations from these verses that you're reading i was like oh yeah i didn't i didn't even look at i did the whole thing about um the rabbis having being exempt from paying tax and it's just it's brilliant i hadn't thought about that so thank you for putting it thought and effort into teaching us these things um one thing that you did say was intriguing mm. you said you claim that this story may not have actually happened I have never seen it. I just assumed it happened. Mm. Not the Which, whole story, just the bit about... Yeah, yeah, the, 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 whether the they actually fish. went and got the fish. Mm. Um, so I guess two, two things. One, you know, did it actually not happen? And then the second one is, um, what lens did you use to come to the conclusion that this was not? This may not have actually happened? So when, when people read other stories yeah. in the Gospels, which may seem like, does that sound like it happened? And... You know, you don't want to dismiss stories because they think, well, it didn't happen. So, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, okay. So, I think, to try and be really super clear on this, um, I'm not saying that Peter getting a coin out of fish's mouth didn't happen. um, And, but Matthew, in writing the gospel, in my view, seems to take an editorial decision to just write jesus's words and not describe the event so the event is not described so 
any so anything that is in the text, you know, there's crazy stuff that happens in Matthew's gospel. We've we've talked about them over the last few weeks. Even there's just a passage just before Jesus healing a boy with a demon and that sort of thing. So there's things that happen in the scripture or in the gospel accounts that are described as happening that probably to our modern sensibilities are hard to believe. Mm. How could that happen? But the scripture is super clear in telling that it did happen. And I would definitely reject interpretations that say, well, it says that it happened, but we know a bit better and we know that it didn't really happen. Or if it said it was demonic, but we sure. really know it was a medical thing. Yeah. No, no, no. That you're, yeah. you're, ta- you're contradicting what is in the scripture yeah. because of your what you mm. think personally as to be... Uh, believable or not that's not what's happening here they've just recorded the words of Jesus they've right? record- yeah. Matthew's recorded the words of Jesus and it doesn't specifically say that it does now different commentators some will say oh there's something in that some will say no there's not anything in that we shouldn't assume that it didn't happen or we shouldn't assume that because the description is here and not the actual event mm. we shouldn't build too much on that or something but so would you so to push you on it would, do you think it happened or do you, do you not, are you not sure I honestly don't know. So it may not have happened. May not have happened. Okay. Not have happened. Do you agree with? <laughs> I, I, Which may be the more minority position. <clears throat> um, we don't know what happened, but I tend to believe that it did happen. I think you've got a very detailed instruction here, which I think if it was just for the benefit of a story, that probably wouldn't happen. And I think part of the point is that he does, he will go and take this coin and pay and that's actually what Jesus is going mm. to do, that he is going to pay. So if it didn't happen, there wouldn't have been a payment. Yeah, and okay. I think the story begins, the, 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 the teaching of, the sto- of this passage, then um, uh, it becomes less clear if, if it doesn't actually happen. For me, I think, I yeah, think it's kind of a logical conclusion to what's being said there. I, I think Matthew it. would have thought it was obvious. But this might well. be <laughs> But that's Brilliant. an opinion. I mean, yeah. there's an interesting parallel as well to another story where Jesus, you know, it speaks, yeah. speaks to them. It's after the resurrection, isn't it? He speaks to them and they've not been fishing and said, throw the nets on the other side. And they did. And they did. And it's like that. It's just, a, it's just a, another interesting thing of like Jesus. Yeah. It, you've got the same elements there of like knowledge yeah. that he wouldn't know, the fish all those sorts of things it's like for me the story the repeated the, I don't know whether this in, in Matthew's account or John's account where if, when he enters Jerusalem for one final time he he quite clearly gives them the description of a cult that's somewhere and it needs oh, yeah. to be untied and, and then they go and they do it and they say this yeah. is, and it is exactly how he said it yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah here's the I, thing right can I just say something you I just think um Another element for me in this story is the supernatural side of this story. Mm. There have been some really big supernatural things happening, the transfiguration and then this the deliverance demonic, yeah. of the demonic boy. Here we've got something happening initially behind closed doors, just Jesus and Peter. And um, it feels like uh, like a, this is, is such a, on a, such a personal level between them that... You know, yes, these big supernatural things happen, but actually supernatural things can just happen at home. Mm. And that's another reason why I think probably it did happen, (laughs) because I think this is an interaction between Peter and Jesus, where Jesus is actually teaching Peter as well. Yeah, I think part of the reason that I'm very peaceful and happy to show different perspectives and have this opportunity at Live Lunch Mm. to talk about the different perspective on this is because... I think we want to encourage people as they're reading the scriptures to really ask those questions of the text. Do we think this happened or not? How sure can we be? What reasons are there to say that Jesus is describing something that would go on to happen? Or why did Mark put it in? Mm. And so even if it's generating those... What did I say? Mark. Did I? Where did he come from? Mark didn't put it in. He didn't put it in his gospel at all. Um, Those are good questions to, Mm. to ask. And I think one of the things that we try and do is uh, when we're putting together preachers, we do have a have a team and Christine's part of it. And you're sometimes there as well, often there um, where we think about these questions together. And we think, what is this text saying? What is the main point? Why is it included? What are the 
things to draw out of it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it is quite unique. I, I don't think I've encountered this in any of the church that I've been a part of, but there is a, we, there's a, there's a significant team of people, um, men and women, all, you know, all sorts of uh, people, myself <laughs> included, um, who, who get together once a week and go through the passage and then the preacher presents some yeah. of the things he's learned. And yeah. there's quite a robust discussion around yeah. uh, things that are being discussed. So it's not just one person who goes into his study and, and then, you know, I'm not saying that's wrong, but there's there's conversation. And I, I think that's helpful in, in realizing that, you know, yeah. it prevents us from being quite monocultural in our communication. Okay. Uh, we're not speaking to a specific demographic of, of people yeah. or individual, mm. uh, which which could be the default of the preacher. But there's mm. a, a range of voices that get to speak into the mix. Mm. Yeah. The th- and the thing is, as well, it draws out. And it, I'm, I'm a firm believer, it, not a firm believer in, well, I can preach this passage the way I did on Sunday, and I think we could turn up next Sunday and we could preach. I could preach the same passage and preach a very different message from the same passage, and, mm. and because there is so much yes. in a given text mm. that you know, some, sometimes people when we do preaching series and spend a long time in a book, um, think, oh, we've been in this book for ages. I'm sure, that, <laughs> sure that is how people feel sometimes. But it's like we could have done five messages mm. on every single yeah, passage yeah, yeah. that we looked at yeah. because there's so much there, and that's why we. That's why I do things like Thrive Study, where yeah. people can actually take the time over several weeks to study it themselves yeah. in a community with others, learning about it, and you know, reading supplementary material about it to get them mm. thinking about all the questions that sort of thing. So just yeah. res- resource plug. If somebody's heard this and they're like, "Wow, this is really interesting. I need to really spend more time studying scripture." What resources would you point them towards? I would go first to Jen Wilkins' book. It's called Women of the Word, but mm. it really helps you know how to do Bible study. Right. And a lot of that is about asking questions. And it's okay not to know the answers mm. because we ask questions as part of a learning process. And sometimes we'll get the answer from someone else and sometimes we'll wait for a while, maybe hear another word, and it will all become clearer to us. I mean, I always say start with a good uh, start with a good study Bible as well. Yeah. Um, you might have a Bible on your phone that you read, hopefully each day and that sort of thing. But ESV study Bible, when I'm ever preparing a preach or studying, that's the first thing I go to. Mm. Have and it just that just helps initially get the main references, the cross references, and um, picks up different ideas in the text. Um, a book that I found really helpful was Grasping God's Word. Um, yeah. du- Duval, I don't so remember like that. Um, really good at principles and how to study about mm. scripture. Really enjoy mm. it. Bible Project is another good mm. place to dip into. Okay. The other thing, just so. to say on the community aspect, is that we all have blind spots mm. and we can read something and not see something. And that when yeah. we discuss things together, that's why it's so good when we get together in small groups yeah. and we're studying something, is that other people will definitely see things mm. that we don't see. And you will also see that in rereading text and I think we're a bit poor on rereading and keep rereading mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. asking those questions mm-hmm. that's the thing with like doing when you do a book of the, of the Bible at, at Emmanuel when we're preaching through Matthew we probably won't go back to Matthew for decades now will we well if we get to the end of it yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, sorry okay <laughs> let's, let's just jump into the text couple of I think yeah. there's a couple of uh, directions I'd like to go down in the last few minutes that we got together the first one being the not giving offence um, for at the individual level okay and then the second one being the whole fear God and, and the emperor yeah, um, yeah so and you know at a at a much more um, macro 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 level mm-hmm. um, what happens when the the emperor and God are in conflict mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but let's let's talk about that but i think for the first one for, for individuals jesus said um however not to give offense to them go to the sea and and you do the thing yeah um what would you say to individuals who might be in, in a work context or a relationship context where they feel like i how would you help them know when to take a stand and uh, for something turn the table over and when to pay the temple tax and not give offence yeah I mean just off the top of my head it's, it's probably you, you will get that in a work context but probably for many people the family context is is the, the one that occurs more most often in terms of even well, whether it's your parents or if you are a Christian and family members are not Christian mm. they're, you're going to have situations <clears throat> that 
there's going to be expectations placed on you a to go to this event or that sort of thing um or just in terms of how you interact with them that offense can be very easily given and we just have to go very uh, proceed very carefully um with that and i think what we see in jesus's uh life and example even in this passage here is jesus jesus's love for people motivates him to go as far as he can in terms of sacrificing his own convenience uh, at cost to himself or whatever in order to serve someone else Mm. and i think that is that is a uh, shaping principle for us if say your family member wants you to go and do something that you say well I'm not really whether, whether like they want you, want you to go to an event and you know, know or, or everyone there is just going to get drunk and it's not an environment that's like you know mm. that godly environment that sort of thing um, and maybe as a, even as a Christian you can sort of put your Christian lens on the fact that you just don't really want to go or it's not that convenient to go. You can very easily play the Christian card and say, oh, well, I'm a Christian and I don't really want to go. You know, you're going, they're going to a casino or something like that. And it's, and it's like, you could go yeah. and it's not going to compromise your Christian values. Yeah, yeah. Well, do all that you can not to cause offense there. Yeah, go, but don't get drunk, don't gamble, mm. but still demonstrate by your participation Yep. And your love for people that you are doing all that you can in one serve because you care about and love and that sort of thing. I think that is a that's you, really helpful. Sometimes as Christians, I think well, again, we can be quick to say, "Oh, I'm a Christian. I don't do that." Yeah. Or go the other extreme is like, "Well, that's my family. My family is important. God knows my family is important. So I just act like they yeah. act if they're not Christian." Yeah, I think I think people can get on a high horse about some things, and here you you see Jesus. It just doesn't matter this text because Mm -hmm. uh, people do pay it because it does maintain the temple it's not hurting anyone here is it whereas when he turns over the tables in the temple um, these money uh, changers have got a monopoly and Mm. they are making money out of people who've come to sacrifice to the Lord and it's a completely different thing and people Mm. are actually uh, being abused in that other situation whereas Mm -hmm. this one Mm -hmm. isn't like Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. and even at the sacrifice of his reputation you know, Jesus is constantly being bad mouth. Oh, he's the one that hangs yeah. out with tax collectors and sinners. Mm. And so, even as a Christian, whether it's our, if if our thinking, well, if I do that, or if I go along with that, even though I'm not going to participate in something that is wrong, mm. but people might, well, you know, people might think that I approve of it. That's what I think. It's like you're free from that. Mm. Okay, you have to be free from that idea of protecting your own reputation Jesus didn't seem that bothered about his reputation mm. at all he was wanted to love the people in front of him I think that we've got a lot to learn from that I know I did this is again plugging the clear vision talks and the interview that we did with Andrew Bunt I'm not asking you to answer this question um, but we did. he did ask answer the question about should we address people by their preferred pronouns oh yeah uh, or you know, or take a stand and say, well, I'm not going to. Is it? You know, we're not going to have this conversation now. But if that if that does interest you, um, yeah, it is worth listening to the way he responded to it. It was really helpful. I, th- I think I'm not going to answer that question directly, but I think oh, what I would say on that, I think it's an example of where, as Christians, it's helpful to think about these issues yeah. in ad- in advance. Absolutely, <laughs> and actually not imagine that this th- these sort of moral or ethical questions or how we navigate the world in front of us is you know yeah we've got we've got to think them through and think what is our conscience and what is our conviction and i think probably uh, on that on that topic there are different christian responses some would say um you know to what it looks like to love and serve the person in front of me is to uh, use the pronouns that they would prefer me to use and that is loving thing and someone else who's a christian might say well, actually, that goes against my conscience because I don't believe that's true, and that's what. Mm. But so, I, on that specific one, I don't think there is a Christian response, or it's a very clear cut thing. But whoever we are, we need to think about it carefully, think about it biblically, um, so that we come to a, mm. a decision that's actually coming from a place of faith and clarity in our conscience, mm. rather than stumble into a, a situation like that 
un, in an unthinking way. It is in a straightforward answer, is it? You you do want to make sure you you've got even for your to frame your own thinking on it to have sufficient context to have sufficient knowledge and understanding um, of the issue uh, before you shape your own opinion. Yeah. So I mean, we don't want to throw out like one line as well. Yes, we should. I know we should. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, because I, even around this table, we might have different views. Uh, on whether we should or shouldn't and why we should or shouldn't yeah and so i think it's definitely worth really considering yeah and i think it goes for a lot of things you know i, I mentioned in the message about um you know the because it's the example of tax and the the, the the government minister uh who was sacked because of uh, you know not disclosing the investigation into his tax affairs and that sort of thing um, and so when you have examples of those in authority and that you know put that into your say your if it was if you you were working for that that person that like your job was to serve someone like, and or in your job you know that there's corruption not or even just dishonesty like if your boss is being dishonest mm. like and you're like working in a business or whatever and you think like what does it look like there to be a Christian is it the right thing to call it out and challenge it is it the right thing to quit your job or is it the right thing to say well i'm not responsible for those but they're responsible i'm not complicit in something that's wrong i'm just going to serve the way so like there's those type of situation that it's like it's hard to say it one way or another uh is as a hypothetical but that i think that is you know come out of this thing it's like is this a moment for just serving god in the situation he's got me in yeah. or turning over tables and calling out yeah. injustice and and there could be specific questions or specific situations like again in your work situation where there's a sense of injustice <coughs> um it's very complicated right you're not asking people to quit their jobs in mass if there's any uh complication but please talk to somebody is my point is talk to your yeah. small group leader uh talk to one of the elders at church um have a conversation about it because i'm sure they may have some perspectives which could be helpful rather than saying this is what you should or shouldn't do. Absolutely. So yesterday, here's an interesting one. Well, it's interesting to me anyway. Um, yesterday I was reading about um, catechism in the um, third and fourth century, as you do. And no, I don't. The, the first, in, in that early church period, if someone wanted to become a Christian, um, they would go in through this process that led up to baptism. If they were a school teacher, there was a, there was a number of different professions that they were involved in. The church would say, "You need to get out of that. You can't do that." Now, many of those are obvious, but one of them included school teachers. Wow! It's like if you want to be a Christian, you can't be a school teacher. But the reason for that is because the culture that they were in was so wrapped up in um, the uh, mythology and cultic religious practices. Uh, of other gods and that sort of thing. A school teacher had a responsibility basically to teach paganism mm. to their kids, mm. to the kids in front of them. So that, therefore, in that context, to be a school teacher was incompatible with with the Christian faith because you're furthering pagan pagan views that were against Christianity. So it just goes to show us like, in every culture and every society, it's not clear cut. Like what, so there's some things are very overt um, and probably in almost every society that would be absolutely wrong and incompatible with Christianity. Yeah. And we now are in, in the UK society increasingly living in a culture that is directly hostile to the Christian message. So every generation there's going to be a slight development in that. And, you know, when I was a school teacher, I was, you know, in a situation where we were encouraged to show our support for LGBT and mm. put up stickers and posters in our classroom yeah, and that sort of thing. That. Yeah. So it's like, now that wasn't forced upon me, Yeah. but that wouldn't have even been something we even considered a few decades before. Yeah. And now there's that, there's that pressure to do it. So every generation is having to address this question of mm. how do I faithfully be a Christian um, n right now? And yeah. it's not the same. As the previous generation. I think we also need to listen to our consciences. Let your conscience be your guide. Yeah. Is that in I, the scripture? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I can resist. Carry on. So our, our consciences should help us when it God comes given. to this. Because they are given by God. Mm -hmm. And um, we have to trust that God is at work in us to will and to do his good pleasure in any situation. 
that we're in. We have the Holy Spirit. We've been given a sound mind. We yeah. are able yeah. to yeah. make good decisions. But it's so complicated because people who <laughs> have certain views and would would even campaign for certain things, which we would feel are, or which are, are some of us, some people would feel, are different to what this what the Bible teaches, are doing it from a place of good conscience, aren't hmm. they? In yeah. their thinking, they're loving people and yeah. they're, they're caring for people. But, but people will have different opinions and um, what's important is our own and our own walk with God and that we feel comfortable with where we've come to yeah. and that we have a thought out position. Now, some of us may feel that we're not there yet. Well, that's where, where we need to get into the Bible and to read around the subject until we can make a, a good, sound yeah. decision. Brilliant. Which I guess this moves us on to the next section uh, of questioning, which is um, 1 Peter 2, which you referenced, where it talks about uh, uh, fearing God and honoring the emperor. Yeah. Now, what happens when the two come in conflict? Which I guess it does get played out in schools uh, yeah. and does get played out with school teachers. Um, yeah. Yeah. What would you say to the school teacher who is being told this is what you need to teach the kids and they might have a different biblical view on it? Yeah, I I think, yeah, again, it's difficult to give an exact thing in, in, in the hypothetical, um, but I think Christians are increasingly needing to wake up to the fact that we are living in an environment, as I say, is increasingly hostile to us, and I think when it comes to what is what is taught, like, like, there is there is no way in which society is neutral mm. okay so even though i'm to give the example of third or fourth century and like this rampant paganism that was what society was all about it's like that is that is in in a sense still the case now there's a lot of doctrines and and um uh, ideologies that are so widely accepted in the culture that actually are in opposition Mm. to the Christian faith it's not like a neutral point of view now actually Christians in this country have in, been in the luxury position for many decades yeah. of having a society that is um, sympathetic and shared a worldview that was fairly similar in a lot of cases but what we've seen in the last couple of decades or it seems pretty much every week now uh, there is another example of how the prevailing worldview and prevailing ideology is directly opposed to it. Mm. Um, so I, th I th this this is it's going to be it's going to be a really interesting thing. I think this is a time for that um, courageous Christians are necessary uh, because the, the 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 culture is calling them out. On yeah. on different issues, and we need to know where we, we need to know where we stand. Yeah. yeah so any, anything you want to add to that, Christine? Before we wrap up? No. Anyway. Um, I'm very disappointed we didn't get to talk about whether fish smell. Oh or not. yes, we've got about that. No, please, I encourage you to bring that in because I said on Sunday that you know, consider how much a uh, a coin might we have stuck. Got, we should have got like sushi or something, shouldn't we, for lunch today? Yeah, but apparently, according to Christine, who's Christian an ex chips. expert angler, <laughs> that the, this coin would not have stunk at all because apparently fish only start smelling after they've been out of the water for some time. I still wouldn't like to receive a coin straight out of a fish's mouth. Would you? This all pre <laughs> presupposes that it did happen, Matt. Well... Because it wouldn't have stunk if it hadn't happened, would it? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think I yeah. Happy, so just to bring it, fish. we we do um, <laughs> Schrodinger's fish humor side. We we, we do yeah. acknowledge that that the worldview that is increasingly getting hostile towards the Christian worldview. Um, again, please, Andrew Bunce, <laughs> I'm plugging some another Q and A. His, his yeah. stuff on um, he talked about um, before you get to answering the question about you know what does the bible speak on homosexuality you've got to tell them well i believe that somebody died and rose again mm -hmm. and you know more than what i believe in some ways it's crazier for me to believe that than mm. what a biblical view on, on sexuality is um but he also talks he also talked about like loving your neighbor mm. and you know you, you even if i hold a view that's different to you it doesn't mean i'm phobic 
you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've, I've demonstrated my love to you I've served you I've mm-hmm. looked out for you I've cared for you for a long time so you know me before you start making mm-hmm. accusations against me and I think just again here the way you answered it was just brilliant but yeah. the, the the mandate that we have to love our neighbor is massive yes. uh, and to really care mm-hmm. For those around us in need, in some ways you care for the weaker brother, yeah, um, yeah. which Paul references in Corinthians, uh, people whose conscience hasn't caught up with their theology, um, just to really love people and, and to serve them. And then from that place, it's kind of harder to make like vile accusations against people. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, the, the final thing I, w- I want to say on it. I, I want to say a final thing. Do you want to say yeah, well, it? Yeah, we can all have a final yeah. thing. <laughs> Christine, do you want a final thing? Yeah, Sorry. Um, oh, I forgot what it was. No, no, I haven't. It was... Um, I mentioned a minute ago about when we're in an increasingly hostile culture, Christians need to be courageous. But I will also also say that we mustn't be afraid either. Mm. Mm. And we Absolutely. can take great confidence uh, in the fact that, yeah. as I mentioned on Sunday, the Christian church in the early first few centuries flourished mm. in an environment that were in a, in a cultural environment that was actively hostile to them. Yeah, they were killing them, not just like... Well, exactly. Them. Yeah. But the... Um, but... The, the Christians demonstrating what Jesus demonstrates here in terms of radical self-sacrificial yeah. love towards those around them mm. won the day, mm. you know, and actually transformed mm. a society to where the the Roman Empire that was, you know, yeah. after them and killing them became officially Christian now. So we, they, they did go from Nero to Constantine, but that took like hundreds of years. It didn't happen overnight. Mm. No, it didn't. And yeah, so the, the expectation yeah. that it could all change in our generation, as much as we were going to pray for it, it mm-hmm. may not. Mm-hmm. But it and will. also the the idea that the culture turning against Christians is a bad thing is not necessarily the case. Mm. Probably, what's more, what's more dangerous to, or more of a barrier sometimes to the the, the extension of Jesus' kingdom is indifference yes. mm. to Absolutely. to the gospel. And a, a culture that is inoculated, and one of the things that we we sort of probably I probably bang on about this every single week, but the generation that's coming up now, people who are you know at Clear Vision Conference and, and younger twenties, teenagers, they are gr- growing up in in an environment that, on the surface of, in many ways, is 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 hostile to a christian worldview but at the same time they're not coming there's an ignorance about christianity that brings a ripeness for the gospel they've not grown up in church they don't know anything about it um and therefore actually when they do start to hear the truth of what jesus has done and who he is and it's like that yeah the, some are receiving it because it's the seeing the radical love that he demonstrates uh, is just a wonderful thing I'm going to close with a psalm I read this morning. Um, I'm, I'm doing um, the guy wrote deeper, Dane Ortland. He mm-hmm. does a devotion to the psalms, and this morning I'm on Psalm five, which shows you how behind I am on my daily reading. Psalm five. <laughs> what is it? I started thinking of the. I have been. Uh, it's only a month behind, right? So <laughs> I, have, I am reading the New Testament and Old Testament as well, but it was uh, this morning. For you are not to go to delights and wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. It will turn around. Because that's the God we worship. Mm. Read Strong the end words. of the book. Strong words. It's a happy ending. Thanks so much for joining us. And thanks Rachel for being our producer for today. Shout yes. out to Jess. He's not well today. Yeah, Jess, we miss you. Get well soon. Um, see you next week. Bye. Bye bye.